Yep. Thank you, Dr. Feltier, for sharing this interesting data, eye-opening data to some extent, and your proposals with us. Uh, for those who want to follow up to this information, if you give us your email address with the feedback forms, we will send you the link to the Drago Protective Ventilation website where we will publish these presentations with a voice over so that you can recall everything afterwards so you don't have to take photos all the time. Yeah? So I'm now happy to give the word to Stefan Wirt to talk about lung recruitment. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, now that you have received an introduction regarding the productive ventilation from Mr. Foutier, I would like to make or address the area of recruitment in the operative setting. And first, I would like to give you an interview of a current literature, but also on a personal perspective on this subject and a few practical tips. Now, Mr. Hettenstirner already dealt with the subject very early on, but what happens in terms when we put the patients on the, on the operating table and perform anesthesia? The loss of spontaneous breathing leads to physiological uh, changes in our biological respiratory system. There is a decrease here in FRC and compliance of the lungs and an increase in airway resistance. This leads to a loss of tone, less volume, the system and the airway dimensions are reduced. This is where the Laplace law comes to play, namely the connection between the surface tension and pressure. In this case here, the smaller the radius, the larger the pressure I have to use to ventilate the alveoli. This leads to the, forma to the formation of atelectasis. Now, here you can see a CT images of a non-anesthetized patient and anesthetized patient have been examined. In this work, I would like to make clear that the problem is by no means over after extubation. You can see a CT image on the left, a unconscious patient, and in the middle, you can see a patient after extubation. And this atelectasis is known to have in the dorsal areas. 90% of all our patients develop very febrile atelectasis in the anesthesia. On the right, you see 24 hours after extubation, uh, 24 hours after extubation, these atelectasis will still detectable in more than 50% of our patients. Now, here you can see a diagram detailing from a work group from Can from a Canadian work group from uh, Mr. Duggan. On the left side, you can see a normal lung with intact integrity of the cells and the perfusion. And on the right side, you can see a heterogeneous picture of a lung with atelectasis. In this case, the epithelial cell integrity is suspended and there is a damage to cell one type, cell two type, and activation of the immune response, response via release of cytokines, TNF-alpha, and activation, the coagulation here. There is an increase, accumulation of liquid, and more hyaline membranes here on this picture, which further limits the gas exchange. You can see that is not a local problem of the lung, no, but rather can imply systemic consequence um, such as sears, sepsis, pneumonia, etc. Here, you know this picture. This is American work involving more than 30,000 patients. Has shown that atelectasis and pneumonia are largely responsible for the development of postoperative pulmonary complications. The authors of this work recommend a preoperative score for assessing the risk of postoperative pulmonary complications. This 11 point score has now been validated. 
These figures may be well known for you, but I want to show you the relationship between the number of compli postoperative complications and po hospital mortality. Highlighted here in red, you see the mortality rate from the number of complications. Without postoperative pulmonary complication, you have a hospital, hospital mortality of less than 1%. With equal or more than four complications, mortality increases almost to 24%. This is significant and we should aware of it during every necessary non-invasive ventilation, reintubation, oxygen apply. Allow me to draw an interim conclusion. I hope I've been able to show that atelectasis is a common and maybe underestimated problem. It is the main cause of postoperative pulmonary complications and associated with a high rate of mortality. Postoperative pulmonary complications are often not seen by the anesthetist because the patients are often in a normal or in the intensive care unit. This is why it is important to do whatever it takes to avoid or treat atelectasis. Naturally, we, know, we now want to know how. Here is a chest CT from a ventilated patient. I divided the chest into four different zones as a model. The extent of the zones is dependent on many factors, for example, patient-related, interaction intervention in, um, related, related to anesthesia management. The blue area here on the ventral is a zone of the hyperextension hyperinflation, which is situated in the ventral area in the back of the patient. The green phase of the zone is the zone which the lungs are usually ventilated up, but the yellow zone consists of atelectatic pulmonary tissue which, however, can, however, can intratidally recruit it per press. This is the most interesting zone because he is sensitive to the application of PEEP. The red fast is the zone which cannot be tidally recruited. This becomes important during recruitment maneuver. In order to better illustrate this, I have included a short video for you. Here, this is an endoscopic image of a rat's sublaral. What I want to show you with this video is how the alveoli constantly recruited and de-recruited intratidally, in other words, during breathing. This means that there is a temporary collapse with each breath, which is referred to as a atelect drama in the literature and can lead to shear stress. This means that we are here in the yellow area of our model. It is therefore necessary to avoid this intratidal continual derecruitment. An established method of this course ventilation with PEEP. Here you can see images of 24 patients of recruitment, please, uh, use it, uh, is it possible for using PEEP. On the left you can see here a, sheet, a CT chest image from a patient before anesthesia, in induction with different PEEP values, here 0 and 10, and the right CT chest image under anesthesia. And of course, macroscopically, you see the increases atelectasis formation during the ventilation without PEEP compared to ventilation with zero PEEP. You can see the aberration on the right where a significant is in indicated in the atelectasis of 10% at PEEP zero at, and 2% at PEEP 10 after anesthesia induction. Now, the work group in Freiburg has a starting point for avoiding intratidal de-recruitment. The compliance change within one breath. Here you can see a normal volume pressure diagram with a typical press which you are aware of. We divide the press into many, many sections and then calculate a volume compliance curve which then results in a typical compliance profile yielding conclusion regarding the intertidal nonlinear compliance. You can see this typical compliance here above and 
above left. And the green profile, in other words, horizontal profile, means optimal respiration in the mechanical respiration perspective. This means that the compliance does not change during a warm breath. An increasing profile is an unfavorable profile because we have a recruitment and de-recruitment in every breath. And a falling profile gives us an evidence of an intratidal hyperextension or overstretched. In the right figure, you can see mixed forms. We were able to show that the compliance profile were significantly more favorable in patients with a PEEP greater than five. I agree with Mr. Fournier. <laughs> in another study, we were able to show that there is a link to be more favorable compliance profiles and ventilation of the lungs. We ventilated the, the patients with different PEEP stages five, seven, nine, and analyzed the ventilation using electrical impedance tomography. And we have seen that this is uh, precisely the dorsal areas, which is where the atelectasis arises, where the lung tissue with a higher PEEP ventilation are recruited. In the upper figure, highlighted in red, you can see the significant more of ventilation with a rise given a PEEP increase. Especially in the dorsal areas, we can see in the lower figure. Now, how does this look from a practical point of view? Here you can see a next, uh, notebook next to the anesthesia machine, which is connected with a fast interface. The software can determine the compliance profile for each breath over eight breaths. It gives us a recommendations, arrows or colors or suggestions to adjust the PEEP accordingly. In this example, you can see a decreasing compliance profile highlighted in red and the recommendation to lower the PEEP. The PEEP is lowered from 9 to 7, and you can already see a flattening here of the profile, and after further reduction of the PEEP to 5, a horizontal green profile as an expression of an optimal ventilation from the mechanical respiration perspective. Now, a flow control expiration is a very new approach to stabilize the alveoli precisely in the dorsal area. After we have already seen markedly positive effects in oxygenation, ventilation, and histology in animal, via active uh, deceleration of the expiration, we have now also been able to show in patients with healthy lungs regarding ventilation in the dorsal areas in the sense of recruitment. In the left picture, you can see the different ventilation curves of a study patient in black you see a volume controlled ventilation. In blue, we have slowed the expiration electromechanically um, like a flow controlled manner. In the middle figure, you can see here the reduction of the flow curve in the expiration flow. On the right side, you can see the typical electrical impedance tomography with PEEP5, PEEP7, with flex and without flex. And practice I already see significant recruitment with flex ventilation. If we quantify all of it, in the case of the PEEP increase, we can see a uniform increase in the dorsal ventral area. But while flex ventilation shows a considerable, considerable increase in ventilation in the dorsal area and possible avoids hyperinflation, in the ventral zones. This should be only a small prospect for a possible future ventilation strategy. Now, we come to the recruitment maneuver. Here are some works that show evidence of the recruitment maneuver. An already older work of a Swedish world gr um, uh, work group involving 30 patients with a BMI of 45 on average demonstrated that the combination of PEEP and the one-stage maneuver is more favorable than a PEEP or recruitment maneuver alone. You can see the chest CT, and on the left side, the macroscopically, there is less atelectasis in the RM plus PEEP group, and on the right side, the RM plus PEEP group here with the square shows significant less atelectasis. Now, 
how dynamically do you have to imagine such recruitment maneuver? How long should you uh, do this uh, maneuver be carried out for? In this work led by Mr. Hedenstein, one stage CPAP maneuver with a peak pressure of 40 centimeter water was performed on 12 patients with healthy lungs. On the left side, CT images are displayed again in a short time sequence. And beginning with the upper left with clear atelectasis here, the upper right image after one second, the lower left after 1.5 second, and after 3.5 seconds on the lower right. No atelectasis can be detected, detected macroscopically. This means that after five seconds, the recruitment maneuver maybe already appears to be successful, uh, successful, which is important because very often it is at this time that the hemodynamic influence will first begin, if at all. This is a very interesting current study from obstetrics. They randomly selected 20 patients who were scheduled for cesarean section. The only difference in the ventilation was the one stage maneuver in the intervention group after the development of the child. The PEEP was eight centimeter water in all patients. And on the left, you can see the compliance process over the, uh, over the time and the significant difference in favor of the recruitment maneuver. And on the right, you can see the better oxygenation in the recruitment group. Now, how should this recruitment be carried out? What criteria or parameters can I use to control my actions? In a study with eight pigs, Mr. Suarez Sipman asked the question of whether dynamic compliance is a surrogate parameter for finding the right PEEP value to prevent the de-recruitment. They said the, rec the compliance, it depends, the PO2, a shunt, and CT analysis with regard to lung ventilation. And you can see the breathing maneuver above and below the compliance sequence of the eight pigs. Here, in this image, you can see a close correlation of the dynamic compliance with the parameters PO2, shunt, and chest CT. Below, you can see that the respiration maneuver again comes from a PEEP of six, then the recruitment maneuver, and then the descending PEEP values. Here, you can see the parabolic compliance sequence, and at the apex here, there is a simultaneously a significant deterioration in oxygenation, in ventilation, and the shunt. This means that after recruitment maneuver, the compliance could give us the indication to adjust the correct PEEP individually in order to avoid further de-recruitment. But what procedures should we do? There are different forms of recruitment maneuver. Basically, there are different forms between a one-stage maneuver, inflation maneuver, sustained inflation, or a multi-stage procedure, PEEP ramp, Tisman maneuver, and so on. Here is a multi-stage recruitment maneuver from Mr. Tusman. This work shows the pathophysiological background of the maneuver which ha has developed because the increasing PEEF in five steps and duration he expected here an hemodynamic stabilization due to preconditioning effects. The alveoli opened at the top st at the PEEP stage with a high peak pressure and after reduction the PEEP here, he expects the closure pressure at a certain PEEP level. After another equivalent maneuver here, he reduced the PEEP just enough to be about two centimeter water above the closure pressure to prevent de-recruitment. Now, this work from Mr. Tusman investigated 20 patients with healthy lungs who had received an orthodontic procedure as to whether this concept offers the possibility of finding the optimal PEEP. As shown on the left, they increased the PEEP, gradually conducted a recruitment maneuver with 20 peak pressure 45 centimeter water for actual 20 minutes and then analyzed the parameter PO2 compliance and FRC. And with a cutoff between 10 and 7, they found more favorable values before the maneuver. Here an experimental animal studies with diseased lungs, which and maneuver type and duration is more favorable with regard to lung function, inflammation, 
and apoptosis. They investigated four different recruitment maneuvers. About le above left, here on this diagram, for the CPAP maneuver or inflation maneuver, at 30 centimeter water for 15 seconds, in upper right with the, the same CPAP pressure at 30 seconds, and on the lower left, a gradual five peep stage uh, with 30 within 15 seconds, and on the lower right, the same measure extended of 30 seconds. And this, on this picture, you can see on the upper figure that with oxygenation, the longer gradual recruitment procedure appears more favorable and the cell damage is more noticeably less for the more gradual recruitment in the lower image. Likewise, more favorable effects are seen in the inflammatory parameters such as IL-6 or caspase 3 apoptosis factor. In animal experience with diseased lungs, the gradual maneuver with a total duration of 30 seconds, which is not very long in clinical practice, is more favorable. Now, how has there been any research on patients on this regard? Here is a study involving 60 obese patients with a BMA greater than 60 who had to undergo a laparoscopic procedure. Four groups were randomized. Group P here with PEEP10, only PEEP10. Group R received a recruitment maneuver without PEEP. Group R and P, the same recruitment maneuver with PEEP10. And the RR PEEP group repeatedly received a recruitment maneuver with a continuous PEEP of 10 every 10 minutes. And you can see the compliance sequence in the figure of upper of left. On the lower left, you see the oxygenation with the advantage in the group with the repeated recruitment <coughs> maneuvers. But you can also see the only temporary effect with one-time recruitment. It is a striking in this work that the oxygenation effect persists in the repetition group for at least 60 minutes in the recovery room. Now, a brief comment on the monitoring of the recruitment measures. CT, IET, chemical laboratory, histological analysis cannot generally be utilized in every clinical practice. A very recent work on 40 children has tried to prove the effect of recruitment maneuvers using ultrasound. In the upper row, you can see from left to right the increasing atelectasis in the ultrasound image. The so-called B lines are shown in the lower row. After special consolidation scores and B-line scores, the data was evaluated. They were able to demonstrate that by monitoring the recruitment maneuver with ultrasound, the anesthesia-induced atelectasis formation could be reduced intraoperatively. Now, you have now viewed a lot of studies and data. Allow me to summarize. Recruitment improves respiratory mechanics and oxygenation. A recruitment maneuver should always be carried out intraoperatively after anesthesia induction and particularly given atelectasis formation. <laughs> recruitment should be undertaken dependent upon the procedure and the patient, but it will be applied to a majority of our patients. In animal studies and some patient studies, the multi-stage recruitment maneuver with subsequent PEEP adjustment appears to be more advantageous. From my point of view, recruitment or avoidance of de-recruitment should be a part of a personalized ventilation for lung protection. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward for our question. Thanks.